All right, everyone, uh, ready to get started with our next talk. So our next speakers are Nicole Fishbane and Ryan Robinson. Nicole Fishbane is a security researcher and malware analyst. Nicole has been part of a research that led to discovery of phishing campaigns, undetected malware, and attacks on Linux-based cloud environments. And Ryan Robinson is a security researcher for Intezer. He specializes in malware, reverse engineering, and threat intelligence. Today's talk is go with the workflow. Thank you very much. I'll just start our wee timer here. So, there we go. Thank you very much for coming to our talk. And pretty simply, what our talk is, is it's about workflow uh, applications and the security implications that uh, come uh, sort of with them, which turns out it's quite a lot. But first, let us properly uh, introduce ourselves. Actually, no, that introduction is very good. Human, but So I'm Ryan. I'm a researcher at uh, Intezer. Um, I mainly specialize in, I guess, cloud threats, uh, a malware. Um, um, in previous roles, I was uh, a security engineer for a consulting company, and then a research and anomalies uh, threat research team. And yourself? Nicole. Hi, my name is Nicole Fishben. I'm a security researcher at Intezer. And previous to that, I was in the embedded R&D department in the IDF. All right, so today we're going to talk about workflows and how dangerous it could be when you misconfigure them and expose them. And we're going to present two case studies. One is Argo and the other one is Airflow. We will explain a bit about the different features of each platform and how it was misconfigured and what information we were able to retweet from there. And we're not going to leave you without some practical advices on how, to you, how you can detect this type of misconfigurations and uh, detect it in your organizations. Yeah. All right, so let's start with what is a workflow? Let's say you have some data in a source database and you want to move it to another centralized database. So for that, you will need to get information, maybe analyze it, and then store it. Each of these functions can be broken into smaller things, like uh, smaller functions, smaller tasks, where each task will pipeline, pipe the relevant information to the next task. And that's how you have a workflow. And you're probably going to um, want to schedule it to execute, execute on certain hours, certain days, and so on. So that's exactly what workflow platforms are meant to do and provide you with this ability. And some workflow platforms cost money, some are free, and some are open sourced. So our research focused specifically on the most popular workflow platforms uh, based on GitHub repo and stars. And we wanted to see, can we find someone that misconfigured the workflow instance? And now we can access the dashboard. And if so, what kind of information we can find there and lastly, if we have access to the dashboard, can we execute malware? So the first case study is Argo. Okay, so yeah, our first uh, case study is uh, Argo Workflows. Uh, in my opinion, the workflow software with uh, the best logo. I love that guy, it's like a squid or something. Uh, octopus, but so. Just a short about uh, Argo workflows. And there's also another software called uh, Argo CD, um, but th this one's really, really popular. So container native uh, workflow engine. And for those who don't know what container native means, it's kind of, it's the base level of uh, infrastructure. So hypothetically, if you can run Kubernetes or containers and stuff, you can run the software. So you can't, it's uh, open source which obviously we love open source, fantastic. It makes it also slightly easier to do some research on, <laughs> so it does, you know, compared to paying per product and then doing sort of research on that. Uh, it's designed for Kubernetes, um, great stuff. And it's uh, incubated by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And these are also the same people that maintain uh, Kubernetes. So it's probably as unofficial a workflow engine for Kubernetes as y you'll get. And then uh, I sort of put as my last point there, it's great for compute intensive jobs and a wee winky face for sort of uh, foreshadowing. That. But the first talk about what a workflow is, uh, Nicole's pretty much covered it all already, but in Argo, it's defined in YAML, and you'll probably know this quite well, like similar uh, to JSON. So it is, um, a workflow would consist of one or more steps. Typically, a step will be a container. It can be a few other things, it can be like, 
scripts or Kubernetes resources, but for, for the most point, people are running containers inside that. And very simply, start a step with an input, capture the output of uh, the processing from that step for your container, and then use that output as another uh, input to the next step, and basically so on until uh, you finish what it looks like. Um, that's just some YAML for a, a Hello World um, for Hargo, and then um, that's what it looks like whenever you can submit it through uh, the server uh, UI. There's also a CLI tool if you know you kind of like the terminal more than using sort of an annoying kind of browser, <laughs> you know. Um, so there's one other important concept is called off mode or authorization mode. Um, there's three of them. Oh, please click. Okay, there's server, client, and SSO. And for the main purposes of this talk, we're going to focus on server, so we are. But one thing I'll just point out before I go further is that server was the default until version 3.0, and maybe this you'll kind of find out why. So, well, and what the, the sort of definition of that is, is that server, see here, in hosted mode, use the cube config of the service account. In local mode, use your local cube config. And in short terms, it's pretty much, if you can access the web GUI for this, and it's in server mode, you inherit those permissions. So um, uh, what this is here is the YAML for the, um, you know, you can use a kubectl and apply like that uh, quick start. But um, in the default quick start that I got, you got all these permissions here, pretty much the full Monty of permissions. So um, pretty much out of the box, like the default configuration, or at least for the quick start, it came kind of uh, a bit uh, permission heavy. So it did. And so Basically, how can that be exploded? And I've kind of boiled it down into a simple equation. And the equation, I sort of say it's server off plus excessive permissions plus external access equals profit. So it does, and you know, you can sort of think what you can do with that. And uh, But for this case study, we, we found something pretty interesting. But obviously, to find something interesting, what you first have to do is kind of look for stuff. So what we've done is we tried to find as many um, instances as possible that were open in the world, and you'll see this with our second case study that we find even more as well. But sort of what we've done for this is use internet census tools, stuff like Shodan, Census. Uh, I, I know that uh, Rapid7 have like an open set of data as well, where they scan the uh, internet and you get those results. Um, if it's sitting out on the internet, there's probably a good chance that it's been indexed by Google already. You know, so you can just kind of Google it and it shows up, or What's a slightly more experimental one, you don't get as many hits, but it still does work, is what I call the brute force. So whenever many companies will deploy something, especially for production, they'll create a certificate for it and like a sort of domain. And you know, it used to be something like argo.company.com. You can actually just permutate a lot of company names and then just stick uh, Argo in the front of it. And you'll actually be surprised at how many you can find. And yeah, we did find some crazy ones. So that's, that's pretty much how we went through finding it. Just Google it, maybe. So when going through one, we find this, like, what? So um, now, to most people, this might not be that shocking. It's just some YAML. But what we found on a few of the clusters was, uh, so this one in particular running for nine months by the time we found it, was a XM rig, uh, Monero uh, cryptocurrency miner. and. So yeah, on, on, on a few of the clusters we had found that, I guess, uh, threat actors, whatever you want to call them, had gone on and started using Argo to deploy, um, you know, uh, 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 rig miners across like all these uh, clusters, like many, many different nodes in each uh, cluster. So that's that's the great part about the compute intensive for it. That particular image was on Docker Hub. It got taken down now. It had been used millions of times, and it was even in an Azure blog for being used against mass attacks against um, uh, Kubernetes clusters. And so, yeah, we found it quite interesting. I wouldn't say it was fully wide scale across all of them. It's almost maybe like someone was experimenting and hit a few of them, or else other people found it out and kind of wiped it out. But yeah, so we find it really interesting. So you can, on your workflow software, you can get. Um, some malware as well. So our next case study. 
All right, so the next case study is Airflow, and Airflow is the most popular open source workflow platforms based on uh, stars in GitHub with over 25 case stars. Workflow is based on Python, so you can write your tasks using Python, and it supports multiple plugin and play uh, plugins. And the core unit, sorry, the core concept of Airflow are the directed acyclic graph. So as we describe the workflows, when you create a few tasks and we, uh, one pipe the information to the next one, you can create branches and so on. And the core unit is a task uh, written in Python. Now your workflow is going to use different variables, global variables, and you can store them in a, a structure called variables. And your workflow is probably going to connect to other services and databases and so on. So to connect uh, securely and store the passwords and API keys that you need for the connections, you can use the connection structure. And Airflow supports logging mechanism to emit metrics and uh, to better understand what is going on in your workflow. Now, we were able to find credentials to these applications, like AWS API keys, Azure API keys, PayPal wallet IDs, and so on, all in plain sight. And just to be clear, we're not saying that these logos are compromised. We're saying that we find lots of credentials to these applications. And these credentials were stored all over the features of Airflow that we just covered. All in plain sight, all are visible through the dashboards. So to understand how we were able to see all this information, we just access the dashboards and we access different tabs. So the top place where we were able to find credentials was in the code. Bad code practices lead to leakage of information. One level of obstruction is when you put your API keys and credentials in the variables. Well, the information is not getting encrypted and it's in plain sight. And the connection structure is actually the one and correct place to store your credentials. You will need to enter the information to the password field when it will get encrypted and will not be in plain sight. Lots of users did the opposite thing when they put the information in the extra field where it's not getting encrypted. The logging mechanism in Airflow has an actual CV because when you would you know, enter your credentials through the CLI, it will be, get, it will be uh, presented in plain sight. And if you connect to the, uh, using the password field in the connection structure, it will be once again logged in the plain sight. And this vulnerability was fixed uh, in Airflow version 1.10 and later. The configuration file is created as soon as you create your first Airflow instance. And lots of users put their credentials in this configuration file. Now, maybe that will be fine. But the thing is that the configuration file can be stored in plain text on the dashboard when a certain flag is set to true. So once again, we, will, we find lots of credentials in the configuration file. And the ad hoc query uh, allows you to run queries on whatever platform is connected to your workflow. And if you're connected to a database, anyone with access to the dashboard can query the, the database. Now, if your dashboard is, um, is accessible to anyone, anyone can query your database. So it's a very dangerous feature. And now we're left with one question. Can we run malware? And the answer is yes. During our research, we were able to find lots of um, container images that are publicly available. So threat actors could replace the legitimate image with a malicious image, and when the workflow will be executed, anyone can, uh, sorry, everybody can uh, run a malicious malware, a malicious container. And we set up a test lab in our test lab and Airflow instance, where we used a plugin called uh, Code Editor that allows you to, run, to write and run Python code. And we were able to create a malicious container. So 
we found lots of information that we were not supposed to see. To see. And it was caused by um, insecure coding practices, by using the features in a wrong way or vulnerabilities. But Airflow did an excellent job on improving the platform. And now it's up to the users to actually um, they update their versions. Happy days and no protection. Actually, we're doing quite good in time. I was sort of laughing, especially for the Airflow um, slides. <laughs> like it's just it's just a blur of like pixels. It's like all sensitive uh, information. It was insane. Like to quantify how many credentials we found, I just want to say it's an absurd amount. <laughs> so it is. But anyway, um, so for the protection part, uh, I would sum it down to one phrase really, and it's the basics, really, and. So the way I said that is, um, and I really want to put this point at the top, is that each of these issues on their own might not actually be that bad, but when you chain them all together, it can be really, really catastrophic. So, and we, like, we, like we've seen this stuff, like mad. You know, you'll have someone, they'll deploy Airflow to their cloud instance, and then maybe the, one of the first things they do wrong is the security groups or the firewall rules as configured, anyone can access. So someone can access from the outside. They get to your Airflow instance. It's a outdated version, unpatched version or something. Therefore, there's no authentication. There's no login, whatever. So they can get past that stage. Then they can get to see your code. And um, the code has hard coded uh, credentials inside that. The credentials, you know, we saw a lot of uh, AWS uh, keys. They have like way too many permissions, and then from that, you know, steal customer data, do whatever. There's so much sensitive information we saw. So, you know, there are kind of multiple points along that line that you could have stopped that. You could have done the permissions correct. You could have even just done like the firewall rules correct. But people just, it, it's every step of the way that they will mess that up, and it, it leads to something utterly catastrophic. So, it does, so, and that's to say, it's kind of like a lecture. Basics matter, secure coding practices. Even if you feel that, you know, you're, sort of making code for something and you feel that no one else will ever see it, you know, are you sure about that? Because, you know, depending on how you do processes within your company, like someone else could maybe mess up and someone else gets access to that code who shouldn't see that code. And then that becomes an issue. Patching, updating, you know, what's really, really nice with um, both of these that we've shown on other uh, softwares as well, you know, they have, like, uh, Airflow itself has some, like, 3,000 contributors, you know, it is being updated all the time and you see that with like version 2, it's so much more secure, they even have like a security tab now when you go in with like permissions control, so update that, get rid of like the CVEs and all. Um, secure configuration, just sort of goes about saying, especially if you're going to use something within uh, production, you know, uh, are you sure that the configuration that you've set that is actually good? Um, permissions, yeah, use the principle of least privilege. You know, you don't need to give the intern kind of god mode for your AWS cloud. You know, again, I've seen it happen before, it's, it's very common. And uh, beware third party plugins. So, you know, I really like the nice example of that. There's a code editor um, for Airflow. Usually, you submit the you know, you can submit the code via like the CLI tool, but they're like, no, no let's put it into the server. And so, Whilst that uh, third-party plugin, it might be useful for you. It could also be useful for an attacker as well. And you can also actually introduce more uh, sort of uh, uh, vulnerabilities in that. You know, if you think about it, um, the plugin is being uh, uh, it's being made, you know, in a separate repository from like the main run. So like the the maintenance of them are not in par with each other. So yeah, beware of third-party plugins. And I almost wanted a full slide for this next bullet point. The default configuration does not equal the secure configuration. So if you're going to put something in the production and do the you know the quick start sort of thing, that's <laughs> that's probably not a good way to go. Again, throughout time, you see the like Kubernetes gets more secure, our flows get more secure, Argo as well. Over time, it does get more secure, but you know whatever that you're deploying, millions of things, the default configuration is not always secure. Just think about that. And last but not least, the documentation is your friend. Again, for each one of these and more products, there is a security page that is dedicated specifically for that product and genuinely read it because it's got some really good advice. So it does, you know, you, you might actually understand what's going on. And uh, I'm going to leave with some 
open source tools. Um, I'm, I'm not really going to go through uh, all of these. You know, you can sort of look at it or take a photo. But a couple ones that I really want to point out: um, the Git Secrets one is fantastic. It'll stop you from committing uh, any credentials to your code. So it'll sort of scream at you if you try to do that. Um, Cloud Custodian is a really, really good one. Um, you develop. Uh, sort of policies within YAML files as well, and then you can run that with sort of AWS Lambda or cloud functions, whatever cloud you're using, and then you can find uh, uh, violations of that. And I like uh, uh, the Magpie project as well. It's really, really good, especially if you want to find what's exposed and all. You know, I've had my CISO come to me and go, you know, what's our exposure in our cloud environments? I don't know. Like, we've, we've got a lot of stuff up there, so that'll really help you to find stuff. And pretty much what we're at about the 20 minute mark and we can go for questions. There's two of the blogs that we wrote on. I assume the left one is, um, yeah, oh yeah. So that's the Argo one and that's the Airflow one. And there's a lot sort of more uh, screenshots and all. So yeah, we've, uh, that's us up to 20 minutes. Any questions from anyone? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. I was about to say, if anyone puts up their hands, I really can't see. You don't have to post your questions on Slido. Hashtag besides SF. Cool. Any questions? Yeah. Most of the container, um, most of the instances were of version one, and uh, as we continued our research, we saw more of version two. But most of them are version ones. Yeah, especially when it came to, you can sort of tell there's a lot of version two out there, but they're not necessarily exposed. It's like you hit the login page for it. So, whenever it came to misconfigured airflows, I would honestly say about ninety five percent of them were version one, and then there was about five percent version two where. Even though it comes more secure out of the box, they still somehow manage to misconfigure. It's, it's almost like you have to actively kind of sabotage version two to make it the major, Yeah, but people do it. <laughs> the major thing in version two is that they added uh, enforced login. So you can just access anything without logging and authentication. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I guess the fact that most most of the exposed ones we found were version one, it's a really good way to say, yeah, like, update your stuff, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Anyone else? No, it sounds about us. Thank you very much. <laughs>